it was actually the day after, the two weeks after we fully exited was the first sort of moment of close to like depressive thoughts in my life. Welcome back to series 10 of 40 Minute Mentor, the podcast on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category defining founders. From purpose led entrepreneurs to Olympic champions, you'll learn firsthand from today's successful leaders on what it takes to be brilliant, all in just 40 minutes. Today's 40 Minute Mentor is Nick Towson, entrepreneur, angel investor, podcaster, and startup mentor. I'm sure lots of you have come across Nick, whether it's through his first startup, Design My Night, which he co-founded back in 2010, and grew to over 100 employees with minimal angel funding before exiting to Access Group in 2017. Or you may have come across Nick more recently and heard of his latest venture, a B2B sales tool called Trumpet, which he's building in public and has been getting rave reviews from lots of our clients. Or maybe you've listened to his popular Pitch Deck podcast, which he hosts, And if not, then I would urge you to go out and download it. It's awesome. I am really excited to dig into Nick's founder journey, unpack some of the highs and lows from his career and share his mentorship with you all today. So Nick, thank you for joining us. How are you? Thank you very much for having me, James. Very well. Looking forward to uh, diving into our conversation. Fantastic. Me too. We always like to warm our guests up with some quick fire questions. So please finish the following sentences after me. Number one, I grew up wanting to be an underground train driver. Number two, the last time I was scared was when? Oh, the last time I was scared was probably paragliding in Turkey a year ago. Just I wasn't scared and then when you have to just run off the mountain, my heart definitely started beating faster than usual. Amazing. I bet that was incredible though. Was it freeing when you were just sort of gliding through the sky? Yeah, it's crazy. Now, once you're actually off uh, and you're, yeah, as you say, you're just up there, it's very silent. So yeah, recommend it to anyone. The most memorable day in my career was? I think that's an obvious one. Uh, that was signing the docs for Design My Night. Yes, can't wait to dig into that a bit later. On the flip side, my biggest failure to date is? I'll be honest, I don't really like look at, at failure as such. And I've been very fortunate in my whole journey. I've sort of hit the peaks that I've wanted to in what I set my mind to. So yeah, I don't really consider failure an option. We have plenty of failure moments within Design My Night, which I'm sure we'll dig into. But so far, I haven't had a cataclysmic failure that I can call on. That's great to hear. And if there was one thing you could change about entrepreneurship, it would be the glorification of being a founder in public, because it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. I'm constantly on a quest to encourage people to be a founder, but understand the physical and mental and emotional toll that it's going to take on you. Yeah, I love that answer. And that's, I guess, a big part of what we have tried to do in this podcast as well is tell the real stories and not over glamorize what is a hard, bloody hard and often lonely existence, but definitely the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Thank you, Nick. I'm really excited to dig into your story in a bit more detail. And I'd like to really start at the beginning. So do you mind just telling our listeners a bit about your upbringing and where did that entrepreneurial spirit come from? Yeah, so I grew up in North London. Interestingly, like I I never wanted to be a founder. It wasn't something that was always on my mind. I did languages at university. I excelled in languages at school. I wasn't very good at like maths and science. So definitely the creative side of my brain works. The other side really doesn't work. And always started getting into like marketing or advertising. So yeah, actually being a founder was never an aspiration. It's unsurprising to most when I say that my dad sort of left school when he was 16 and then actually went on to set up some companies in the fashion industry. So ever since I've been alive, he's had his own business and businesses. So I've seen that firsthand. And actually my mum as well, she's a beauty therapist and she's had her own beauty therapy room as well. So actually I was surrounded by it all the time. Like My parents didn't have conventional jobs and didn't work conventional hours. But still, yeah, it was never at the forefront of my mind that, oh, that's what I want to do. And dad always said to me, you know, I think a lot of people thought I would sort of go into the fashion industry and and work with dad and take on his businesses. But yeah, he didn't want me to do that. Interesting. 
there's definitely a strong entrepreneurial thread in your family. That makes a lot of sense. I really like the fact you said that you were more into the kind of creative side and arts and weren't as good at as maths and science because that's exactly me. And I always, I guess I've always had this fear in the back of my head that being rubbish at maths and not that numerate would hold me back in founder life. And I guess today it probably hasn't. And it's great to see all the success you've had. I guess you've you've had to work on that over time or has it just, have you just leaned into the things that you're really good at? I think, uh, you know, Excel became my best friend. So um, I'm like dreadful at maths. Like I'm not even joking the level of my maths. And actually my first job after university, I went to the graduate scheme at L'Oreal. And back in the day, that was a very popular one and they had very rigorous testing. And we had to do creative tests, marketing tests, and there was a math test. And at the end of the two days, the HR lady pulled me in and said, we're in a bit of a quandary with you because it, you scored probably one of the best marketing and creative scores we've had, but your math score was probably the worst we've seen in like five years. So I just had to plead my case to them and say, look, I'm here for marketing. I'm very good at Excel. I don't know why you were giving me like GCSE maths questions. I can't see how that affects my day-to-day work. So if I've scored very highly in the marketing, then, you know, give me a shot because I can manage a P&L and a budget in Excel. I don't need to do that quick maths in my head in this job. And luckily they did take a punt on me. I'd love to talk a bit about Design My Night, a huge success story. Do you mind telling us a bit about where the inspiration came from for anyone that hasn't heard of it? Because I hear it's linked to a night out in New York, which sounded intriguing. Yeah, so it was Andrew who I sort of met week one at university, uh, like became sort of best mates from uh, early on. We were in New York on holiday. We weren't there to think of ideas or anything. And yeah, we were on a night out and it was twofold. There's actually a website in New York, which doesn't exist anymore, which was all around sort of drinks deals, like where to go and get a drinks deal. And then the other side was when we asked the hotel concierge, like, where should we go out tonight? He was like asking us loads of questions, like what area, what type of music do you guys like? What type of night are you up for? So I think just both of those combined, we just started chatting. We can't remember who sparked the conversation, but we just started chatting that night over quite a few frozen margaritas about maybe if we can combine the idea of deals and concierge in a a nightlife site in London, that could be interesting. So we just sort of sort of had fun with that idea that night. And then we were like, okay, when we get back to London, let's just start very casually scoping it out. And that's sort of how the seed of it started. I love it. And what did Design My Night become for those that don't remember it? So it's gone through a big journey. So that start of the idea of like a deal site you know, was quickly squashed because I spoke to my friend actually who worked at Diageo. And back in the day, we're talking like 2010, the main website revenue would have been advertising. And she said to me, look, Diageo, et cetera, aren't going to advertise on a website that's about drinks deals. So they obviously can't promote cheap drinking. So we actually had to pivot straight away. So that's when we got home and started thinking at that time, all like the compare the market and all of those websites and the opera singer and the meerkats and all of that were sort of booming. So we thought, oh, why don't we apply that to nightlife? So we pivoted to being like a comparison site for your night out so we were like the first comparison sites you could pick your budget pick your area and then we would give you a place to go and then it moved into a bookings website so then you could make a booking into all these bars that were listing on our website and then the big pivot for us was into software where we actually then built our own software that bars pubs and restaurants could use to manage their own bookings so competing with the likes of open table and book a table and we also built a ticketing software as well to compete with sort of Eventbrite and Ticketmaster. So how it ended up was a listing site, which when we sold it was getting about 8 million uh, uniques a month. One in six Londoners was visiting it every month. We're in 22 cities across the UK. But then the other side of it was these two SaaS tools which actually was sort of the rocket ship of Design My Night, which most people that use the site didn't even realize that we're actually a software play behind the scenes. But that's why we were acquired. And and that's how we really sort of got the revenue working quickly as well. Firstly, huge congrats on, on all you've achieved. We'll come to the exit in a minute, but we're taking you back to those early days, what was the moment you decided 
to go all in on it because I think we all remember anyone that started a business, that sort of moment where you went, okay, I'm going to go for it. What was that moment? And then it'd be great to understand to the point earlier about being realistic about startup. Like what did you find most difficult once you had decided to go for it in those sort of early days? So we were very pragmatic with the whole thing, which actually was a theme throughout the whole Design My Night journey. Um, We spent a year building the site and starting the site while in our jobs. So I was still at L'Oreal. The classic story, but true, like Andrew and I would meet most weeknights. He worked at Accenture. We would meet up every weekend. And on the weekends, it was more like pounding the pavements, going to chat to bar owners, pub owners, just like, look, we're building this platform. What do you think? What don't you like about Time Out? What would, you know, if a new one was coming, what would you like to see in it? How can we help you? We did that every weekend. And on the weeknights when we met up, there's a, a Starbucks just off Regent Street because he lived in South London. I lived in North London. So we met pretty much every night in that Starbucks with good Wi-Fi. And that was more about the website itself and the strategy. So we did that for a year. But the pragmatic side of it was we just saved hard. So we knew we would need our own personal cash. And we were very fortunate enough to be earning good money. So you know we made that conscious decision not to go out really limit sort of going for dinner with friends and then just save hard for that year. And then actually after a year, I left L'Oreal and Andrew stayed at Accenture and we split his salary for six months because he was on a much bigger salary than I was. And then after six months, he then jumped ship as well and we went full time. There was no obvious moment that we were like, this is going to happen, let's do it. I think we just got to a point where... There was traction, small traction. The traffic was growing slowly. Bars were really interested in what we were doing. And we just couldn't accelerate it while doing our job. I remember, I think a big moment was for me was my boss at L'Oreal, who's now a good friend of mine, pulled me aside one day and said, I know you're up to something. You keep like disappearing into meeting rooms. It was an open plan office. So he said, all I'll tell you is your L'Oreal contract says you can't be doing something else while working at L'Oreal. So whatever you're up to, just bear that in mind. So that was a bit of a a kick in the ass for me. So actually pretty soon after that conversation was when I left and we thought, look, we'd saved enough money. We're going to live very frugally. There is traction. We've got to give this a go now. Let's go for it. This says a lot about the pragmatism, yes, but also just the hard graft and the commitment and the time. Like It's just a great example to, I think, young entrepreneurs of uh, you know, one way of doing it. And you did it with minimal funding. You built this amazing business, grew the team to over 100. You must be so proud of so many different things. And there's, you already alluded to the evolution of the business. But what were the kind of highlights in that time that you look back on? It's just like, that was incredible. The team we built, was amazing. Like uh, we managed small teams at L'Oreal and Accenture, but how we nurtured the team because we didn't raise big funds. We could hire like juniors, so we worked very hard hiring on personality rather than CV. We hired people that wanted to start a career that were passionate about the project. Um, we gave everyone share options in the company. Early on, we built this young team around us that were like sponges that had the right personality to succeed. And Andrew and I just worked very hard with them on growing them as managers, growing them in the culture of what we wanted our managers to be at Design My Night and actually seeing their progression. And, you know, when we sold pretty much all of the early sort of 10 People were still there and in managerial positions across the business. I can't think of one time where we hired in a manager externally, to be honest. So that was a conscious decision we had to do because of budget. And it required a lot more effort from us as founders because we had to be on top of every department while also growing those people. But that was a really proud moment. And now a lot of them have gone on, so not a design by night, have gone on to amazing careers in their department, in big companies, some are starting their own businesses as well. Sort of seeing them all go on is brilliant. Yeah, that's great. And really hard to do as well, to do it that way, especially when you have so many other things to invest that time in people is super impressive. And I'm looking forward to coming back and talking a bit more about that. And obviously the exit happened in 2017 to Access Group. What was that like? I mean, you said it was the proudest moment of your career earlier, but it's so hard to beat that. So I'd love to know, like, firstly, how you felt in that moment, but also what made you then decide to go again with Trumpet? So 
the exit process was actually like eight months. So it wasn't the case that, you know, you might see in TechCrunch or whatever, this company come along and slap cash on the table. So it was a, an eight month process. We spoke to lots of bit. We, we, at that point, we were actively selling the business. So we'd reached a level of revenue and EBITDA or profit that we knew we'd get a valuation that we were happy with as founders. So it was a very conscious decision that we went out to market and then put us, ourselves on the rack to sell. So it was a long process. We spoke to lots of businesses. We had lots of meetings. So I think it was more a sense of just relief in the moment, getting the deal over the line. And it was a bit of a stressful last day as well. So we were meant to sign the docs at like 9 a.m., but we didn't sign them until like 6 p.m. So there was a last minute issue on the day when we actually signed it. I think it was just, yeah, this overwhelming sense of relief. We had a two-year earn out. So actually, we signed the docs on a Friday, but Monday we were back in the office and knew we had another two years. So at that time, it wasn't this sense of just total freedom. And yeah, I think as founders, Andrew and I actually very rarely stop and pat ourselves on the back. So I still don't think it's fully sunk in what we had achieved and what we have achieved. I think we're always just striving for what's next. It was never like wild celebrations between us. I think it was just an internal sense of pride that we'd achieve what we wanted to achieve. And that sort of led us on to Trumpet. So we actually fully exited Design My Night at the end of 2019. Obviously, then COVID hit a few months later. So, you know, the plans of going traveling and relaxing, we were all stuck at home. So it was actually the day after, the two weeks after we fully exited was the first sort of moment of close to like depressive thoughts in my life i'm normally a very sort of mentally strong person upbeat kind of guy but yeah i was just like what the hell do i do now i'm like early mid 30s i've essentially achieved what i wanted to achieve financially now i don't need to work and actually it's the first time i lacked purpose i'd always had purpose in my life ever since school i worked very hard then university then l'oreal then design my night so i'd never actually had to think about what drove me. And for the first time in my life, I was, you know, very happy in my private life and I've got a great family and friends, but, you know, I need more than that in my life. So it was just a bit of soul searching and same for Andrew. And we actually just said, look, what do we love doing? And it was building startups. Uh, it was the cut and thrust of brands, marketing, building a team. But what we did say is if we're going to go again, we want to bring in a third person who would act as CEO and Andrew and I could focus more on the stuff that we love. So for me, it's sort of like marketing sales. Andrew's very good at like product operations. So we didn't want to be the face in the office of the new business, but just do the stuff we love basically and then have a much bigger impact because we could focus on the stuff that we're good at and we enjoy. So yeah, Trump, it was probably like a six month ideation process to get to like, yeah, let's do it and build it. And then we approach Rory, who's our third co-founder in Trumpet, who delighted to come on board as well. And yeah, that's been a wild ride already in just sort of a year and a half. This podcast is brought to you by JBM, a values-driven executive search firm that specializes in connecting world-class general managers, COOs, and commercial and marketing leaders into the fastest growing startups and scale-ups and top tier VCs on a permanent, fractional, interim, and advisory basis. But JBM are not your typical search firm. We focus on long-term relationships rather than transactional interactions, whilst also creating events and content, just like this podcast, to inspire and connect talent everywhere. So, whether you're looking for world-class diverse talent for your team, or if you're looking for your next startup leadership role, our team would absolutely love to chat to you. So head over to jbmc.co.uk to find out more or drop us a line on info at jbmc.co.uk. But for now, back to more insights from today's 40 Minute Mentor. And I've heard such good things about Trumpet. So looking forward to delving into that now. I mean, for those that haven't heard of it, Tell us a bit more about what the business is and how you ultimately came to deciding to build that business. So yeah, Trumpet is in the sort of sales uh, buyer enablement space. It's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. 
And actually the idea came, you know, when one of these founders speak to me and say, like, how do you come up with your ideas? For me, I just look at my day-to-day lived experience. Any touch point that I'm engaged with uh, day-to-day, I'm thinking, how can we improve this or could this be improved? And obviously we had 10 years of Design My Night to think back on. And Andrew and I were just looking at all the different teams and actually sales is really antiquated. Sales was the only team that you've got CRM, HubSpot, Salesforce, and then you've got all these outreach tools that, you know, on LinkedIn and stuff to find the contacts. But then everything in between is emails, emails, PDF decks, Google Drive. It's really antiquated system. Whereas, you know, you could see Figma for your product teams, Trello, Slack, Notion. There's all these tools for other teams that were coming out, but nothing in the sales space. So that was sort of our starting point. And then we came up with the idea about these micro sites. So we were like, okay, well, how can you stop sending 80 emails to get a deal done? So we were like, well, maybe if you build a collaborative space where you can bring the buyer into your world, you can house all of the collateral, your deck, your use cases, your pricing, your testimonials, all in one space rather than 50 emails. So that was our starting point. We spoke to 150 salespeople and founders to validate the idea, got great feedback from them, of which has went into the V1 of the product. And yeah, it's sort of been gangbusters since then. Have you approached the building of the business differently to design my night? Obviously, I guess one aspect is you have a CEO that isn't yourself or Andrew, but yeah, any other approaches that perhaps you've learned from the previous business that you've taken into this that or done slightly differently? We approach it very differently. So because Trumpet A uh, is self-serve, so people can just sign up and get going like Notion. So it's instantly global. Whereas Design My Night was a much heavier, you know, it's a big media play and it was selling to restaurants where you had to go in, sell them the software, set them up. So Trumpet was a much lighter touch, instantly global. I think how big the market is. Everyone you know has a sales team. Like everyone, whether you're a D2C, B2B. So sales is just monstrously big. So we actually went down the VC route. So we were like, this is going to be a hot space. We knew it and it has proven that as well. So, you know, there's lots of competitors coming out of the woodwork in this space now because it's buyer enablement has become a very hot space. And we knew that was going to happen. We had to go quicker, go bigger than Design My Night. So we raised about $3 million from various VCs and angels. So the big difference is hiring. We still hire not based on CV. Personality is still hugely important to us, but we've hired people with a bit more experience. So actually, you know, we've hired a manager already in customer success, in marketing, in dev, in product, in design, and really empowering them just to get on with it. So we're here. This is the strategy. This is how us three as founders are moving the business forward. But we just want you to get on with it. No, you're the experts. You're going to manage your team, not us. So we, from a person point of view, we've taken a step back, which has, again, freed us up to focus on other things and not micromanage the business across the teams. So I think that's a very different way of doing it. But again, one thing I'm adamant on is not just hiring someone from Stanford on 100 grand. Like We still act like we don't have much money. So every penny we spend as founders, we question it. We won't just offer someone else an extra 10 grand because they've asked for it. So we still run it very frugally, but we're just hiring a bit further up the ladder than we were at Design My Night. I know you're building Trumpet in public. So sharing with the world, price you're going on. To, so why did you decide to do that out of interest? And how has that process been for you? Have you found that, has that added pressure? Has it been kind of a, beneficial because you get kind of instant feedback i'd love to just hear your thought process behind doing it yeah it's sort of twofold so when we say building in public it's a building in public to our customers which is then very different to building in public on say linkedin so when i left design my night i decided to go all in on linkedin this was strategic because i knew if i could build up a following on linkedin i would be building a tool down the line that i'd be selling back to my followers So that was strategic, but also I just saw so much BS on LinkedIn from founders who hadn't been founders giving founder advice. This is how to exit a business, but they've never exited or they say they have, but it was like a merger, not an acquisition, or this is how to build a team, but the biggest team they managed is fine. So I was like, actually, I've learned so much in those 10 years that I want to pass this on as free knowledge. 
I do a lot of mentorship as well with different programs. So I sort of see LinkedIn as my extension of mentorship where, you know, I can't obviously give everyone my one-to-one time. So I just share very honest, real insight into what we did at Design My Night and what we're doing at Trumpet. And that method is successful. And as we continue to build out Trumpet on LinkedIn, like sharing thoughts, uh, what's going well, what's not going well, probably 60, 70% of our customer base is from LinkedIn. That is where B2B salespeople live. So it might be the unsexy sort of social media in most people's eyes, but actually if you're selling to B2B, that's where they all live. So actually it's been very beneficial from us. We put a strategy behind Rory as well. So that was very strategic. So he never really posted on LinkedIn. He's a sales guru. Like he was sales lead of a mayor at Hotjar before he came to Trumpet. Uh, I've learned a ton from him about sales. So I was like, look, you've got so much value to, to share about sales. So like, let's put you on that track. So I talk about founder stuff. He talks about sales. The following is shot through. He's nearly caught me up, actually. Uh, he's very dedicated to posting more than I've become. So that was very strategic and has worked very well for us. The other side is building in public to our customers. Biggest advice I can give to founders, and it's one you'll hear often, but one that you have to go by is speak to your customers. So we have a public roadmap for our customers. They can add features that they want added to it. They can upvote or downvote stuff that's on there. We constantly are asking them for feedback, whether that be phone sessions with the founders or with our product manager or our head of customer success. Every marketing email we send out to our users, we point them to our public roadmap. And the response for that, which shows the engagement of our users, has been amazing. We've had like hundreds of features added. We've had over 800 upvotes to the features that are on there. And it shows we care. So we hook up our public roadmap to our GitHub. So actually, when we do release one of those features, everyone gets emailed that upvoted. This feature has been released. So thanks for upvoting it. It's now been released. So actually... It just shows you you care what your users think. And that's a tough line to go as a founder. You obviously need to build your own strategic plays. You don't want to just listen to your users. But most of the best smaller features, let's say, and UX and UI changes come from your users who are using it every day. So that's been a great way for us to build a bit of a community behind Trumpet as well. I'm sure for the customers, there's validation there. They feel like they're having an impact in building their business to suit their needs. This is the win-win, really. It's fantastic to hear. You've obviously been going for two years now. I've heard amazing things about Trumpet. I am actually going to sign up because I feel like this is perfect for JVM. And I was talking to somebody the other day about it. So I'm excited to explore it myself. But what have been the, the best bit so far? And I'd love, this is obviously a huge, huge, this, the market is massive for you. So what have you achieved today? If you're happy to share some facts and figures and exciting stuff. And what are the plans for the future? Because it feels like the sky's the limit for you. We have got over 5,000 users on the platform now, which is great. That's some incredible logos. I think we thought it would take a while to get up to those enterprise customers, but you know we've got the likes of Sky, Amex, OpenTable using our platform. Um, so like very big logos uh, across their teams. We actually support customer success as well. So you, you can onboard in our microsites. So, you know, our best users are using us across outreach, account execs and customer success. And you see this one microsite, as we call them pods, all the way across the journey, which is great to see. We're growing quickly. Uh, we always want to grow faster. Obviously, the VCs want us to grow faster as well. But the double digit growth we're seeing month on month is well above what you would hope for of a fast growing company. So that's great. We've got customers across US, Europe, and, and UK already. For us, where it can go, you know, our pitch to the VC, and which we stand by, is there's no reason why we can't be as big as, as a Slack. So you know, every business, we want Trumpet to be that sort of hub spot or Salesforce in their sales stack. So it's, okay, our sales team are going to use HubSpot and Salesforce and Trumpet. Our communication platform is going to be Teams or Slack. Our marketing team are going to use Canva and Figma. There's no reason why Trumpet can't be as big as that and be as pivotal in their tech stack. And I think the tough thing we've hit is the, obviously the macro climate at the moment. So everyone's tightening their belts. Everyone's, not everyone, but lots of companies, especially scale-ups, are cutting their workforce. But look, we built Design My Night in 2010, which was recession. And what we learned about building a nightlife site in a recession is people especially in the UK, want to go to the pub. 
So they might not go on holiday because they can't afford it, but they'll sure as hell go for a drink. So actually, it was a good time for us. And what we're seeing with Trumpet, our whole mantra is we will help you close more deals and we will help you close them quicker. So it's basically more revenue quicker. So we're not just a nice to have, like we are here to get you more revenue and quicker. So that message is resonating really well. We're also doing a bit of an interesting play whereby we've integrated with all the tools you can imagine. So you can drop them into your microsite, you know, Google Slides and Loom and Vidyard and HubSpot. You can drop them all in your pod, but we're also building our own versions of those. So we've just built our own Loom. We built our own version of Typeform. We built our own version of DocuSign. We're just about to launch our own proposals platform. So actually, what we also say to our customers is we can save you about 400 quid a month per seat by not having to buy all these tools because they're already included in Trumpet. But if you do love DocuSign and you want to use DocuSign, hey, we're integrated with DocuSign as well. So, you know, another line we can do in this macro climate is not only are we helping you close more deals quicker, we're also saving you money at the same time from using all those tools. That's sort of the message we're going out to the market with. Love it. Thank you for sharing that, Nick. Uh, super exciting. And I can also see why this time around you decided to go down the VC route. Whereas with Design My Night, it was pretty much bootstrap. Tell us a bit about your decision making process for that. And how have you found the fundraising process? You're clearly, you know, super experienced entrepreneur who's done the other way. So yeah, how have you found that? I did talk a lot about bootstrapping on LinkedIn, obviously, because we did it at Design My Night. And I think I got a bit of heat when I said that Trumpet, we've just raised VC money. But there's no right way to do it. There's no right or wrong way to do it. Uh, bootstrapping, it was our first business. We didn't even know about fundraising, really. I was like early mid-20s. The investing scene was very different in 2010 as well. It was very Silicon Valley based. So we just didn't have the contacts. We didn't know that was a thing. So we just cracked on and thought, okay, well, let's just build a viable business. I have a lot of views, which I won't go into now on the VC world and the problems with VC and the problems with just throwing tons of cash at, at founders that have never built a business before, never built a team before, never managed a P&L before, but have an idea. It's not surprising that most of the time it goes wrong. So we've taken a lot of our mentality, as I said before, of penny pinching, watching what we spend and growing a viable business to get to profitability still with Trumpet. Like that is still at our core with Trumpet. We've just got a bit of a buffer and we can hire more senior and we can spend a bit more on marketing. So that's sort of how I look at it versus they're completely run in different ways. And the, the fundraise itself, I, I actually did like a four part post on this on LinkedIn a while back. Really tough, really tough. There's two exited founders and Rory who's incredible. You know, I can't remember the exact stats. I put it on the post, but we outreached to over 150 VCs. We had lots of contacts. I'm an angel investor myself, but we had to do cold outreach. We were very public about our raise again, and we had VCs outreaching to us. And actually, a couple of our investors came from them cold outreaching us. Lots of no's, lots of excitement, but too early. We were raising pre-product. So too early for us. Love what you're doing. Love you guys. But it's a no. Come to us when you're more established. So we got tons and tons and tons of no's, even as two founders that have just exited. So I think that's important to know that we were in the trenches like a first-time founder would be. We had the leg up because we had some contacts. But just having a contact doesn't mean they're just going to give you money. So yeah, we got tons of no's. We had tons of interest at the same time. We were lucky at the end that we could sort of pick the VCs we wanted to work with at this stage. But yeah, it was like a intense three weeks of back-to-back -back meetings five days a week from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. because of America, nonstop. So it really takes you out of the game as well when you're fundraising. And I think people think just because we had raised before, it's just a, a piece of piss for us to raise. But no, we if we had to outreach to 170 people, first time founders are going to have to outreach to 250 people. Like is a, a numbers game. It's a sales process. So if you think you can just reach out to 10 VCs and you get 10 no's and you're finished, then you're going about it all wrong. The struggle is real, even for really seasoned, experienced and successful entrepreneurs. And I think that's a, an important lesson. Just quickly, for anyone that's listening to this, that is kind of weighing up bootstrapping versus VC, 
have you got any just particular advice for anyone that might be in that quandary right now? Because obviously in this macro climate, it's a difficult one to for some people. So what do you say to them? I always say like, especially in today's climate, if you can get revenue on the board, you need to do that. So whether you bootstrap to get revenue on the board and then go to VC, it's a very tough climate at the moment. So you have to do all that you can to show that people want to buy your product. That requires bootstrapping. And, you know, whether you're bootstrapping for six months to prove that or a year to prove that, you're going to be in a much better position if you've got some traction to then go and raise. I think the other big thing that most founders don't think about is what do you want out of your business? So Andrew and I, when we built Design My Night, we weren't interested in growing a unicorn. We weren't interested in getting 300 million pounds each in our bank account. We had a very specific figure in our mind of how much, what financial freedom looked like to us. And that's what we went for. And to sell Design My Night for the figure we did, it's not a VC business. VC isn't interested in selling a business for 20, 30, 40 million dollars. So if for you as a founder, you want to go and do the unicorn journey, fine, then you know you probably will have to go down the VC route. But if as a founder or founders, you want to take two, three million pounds each from your journey, you can go and achieve that without VC. You can go to angels, you can go to syndicates, but you might not be a VC backable product. VCs are only interested in the ones that are going to go for billions. And 99% of startups at start are on that trajectory. And that's not a bad thing. Becoming financially free but not being a unicorn is still success. There's only the press like Sifted and TechCrunch that celebrate the huge businesses. But there are thousands of startups selling for 5 million, 10 million, 15 million, 20 million, which are making the founders very wealthy because they also haven't given up lots of equity. So I think you need to ask yourself as founders, what do you want from it financially? And what journey do you want to go down? Because a VC route is very different from a, a bootstrap or angel route. Great advice. No, thank you. Before we get to our wrap up questions, I just wanted to quickly come back to that topic of hiring growing teams because you've done it really effectively in two businesses now. And the first thing I want to pick your brain on is going from a solo kind of operator, IC type role to managing a team, which is a really difficult transition for many to make, but it's part of, a, I guess, uh, evolving your career. So any advice for anyone that is in that situation now, just going through that transition, is there anything you'd uh, suggest they think about? So I th if you're hiring your first sort of team members, number one, I say the first 10 are vital. I call them your iron ring. Like they are the ones that should be following you throughout the whole journey. They're the ones as your company gets to 50, 60, that are your mouthpiece, your eyes and ears on the ground, because you won't be there. So those 10 need to be a personality fit as well. You need to know that you can work with them. They can work with you. They get the vision. They want to go on that journey with you. You've almost those early hires. They also need to have that startup mentality as well. Because all early hires, whether it's marketing, product, design, sales, it's going to be nuts. It's going to be crazy. You're going to be asking to do lots of different things. The strategy is going to change overnight. So, you know, if, if you're hiring someone and they're the type of person that likes everything mapped out, planned out, they know exactly what they need to do for the week, they might not be the right person to hire. So you need to find the right personality fit for, for you and as a startup. That's very important. You then need to give them the freedom to excel. So as a founder, your job is to set the strategy, set the direction of the startup then you need to keep them in check to make sure they are following that strategy, but give them the freedom within that to go and do their thing. But it's the classic thing, hire people better than yourself. But you know, as a founder, you can't be good at everything. I'm really not. So you have to hire people that are and can teach you stuff. And as long as you are then still setting the strategy of that. So don't micromanage, let them flourish. And the hardest part of also in building a team is hiring, but you need to be ruthless. You know, it's something you don't really think about. It's a horrible thing to have to do. But in the early years, if someone is toxic or if someone isn't the right personality fit or if they're just not performing, you need to get rid of them because in the early years, a toxic person can permeate the whole business and you also can't afford to carry anyone. So if you see any of those traits, you need to get rid of them early, set longer probation periods. We actually designed my night. It was six months and that gave us a really good framework to see if they were the right fit for us. To be blunt, we got rid of people after two weeks. We messed up on the interview and they were not the right personality fit. It wasn't to be horrible or spiteful. We just had to make those decisions quickly. So 
you need to be ruthless as a founder as well, which is something you probably are not thinking about when you're going into it. Such important advice. And as somebody that has struggled with that in the early days of JBM, the hardest part of the job by far. But I've also learned the importance of acting quickly. And you can still do that in a human way, can't you? I guess the final question for me around people in talent is Trump is going gangbusters. You're going to be hiring great talent over the years ahead. So what's your approach to recruitment now? And for anyone listening that wants to join the business, what are you looking for in anyone that does get into an interview process with you? So yeah, so we're at 17 now. We're two years old, but technically we're sort of a year old. We sort of launched it this time last year. So be at 17 pretty quick. It's what I mentioned. So, you know, we're quite lucky because we've built up a profile that when we do put job apps out, we get lots of applications. We're incredibly personality led. That's the first tick you have to pass for us. So the, we normally do a three stage interview process. So number one is a chat with Rory. That's more personality fit. Number two is a task. Whatever job role you're coming into, you'll do a task. We pay you for your time. And, you know, for, for example, our sales hires, we ask them to pitch us trumpet. Here's your login, go and understand it and then pitch us trumpet, how you would pitch it. The design, it's go and redesign this page. You know, let's see how you're thinking. So we set you a task and then the final chat will be with Andrew or I and Rory. And then if it's a team member under a manager, the manager as well, which again is what are your aspirations as a person? And are you going to be a good fit for trumpet? But are we going to be a good fit for you as a business as well? So we go hard on personality, hard on our values, hard on culture. But because we are hiring a little bit more senior now, uh, we want to see that talent. Because if we're giving you that freedom to excel, you need to have the talent to do that. We've hired very quickly at 17. We're sort of having a bit of a break at the moment. So we'll probably be hiring again at the start of next year. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of applications off the back of this conversation too. So uh, good luck with all of that. Nick, it's been a real joy and pleasure. It's a conversation I've been hoping to have for a while. So thank you for coming on the podcast. We've got three final quick wrap-up questions. This is 40 Minute Mentor. So I have to ask, if you could be mentored by anyone dead or alive, who would it be and why? So as like a marketeer in my heart, I've got a good design eye, but I'm not a designer. And I love design. Like I'm constantly trying to learn and be better in design. So for me, it would be someone like Johnny Ive, obviously who designed all the Apple products. I wouldn't mind being mentored by him to uh, hone my design eye even more. We've also, this series, brought in a new feature, a new question called the mystery question, where we've told our 40 Minute Mentor community that you're coming on the pod and they've sent a few questions. So question roulette. So can you pick one, two or three and I'll hit you with what they've given us? We'll go down the middle with two. Nice. Okay, number two. Nick, you're a leadership figure for LGBTQ plus founders. How have you seen the ecosystem become more inclusive for LGBTQ plus founders and where are the gaps? Very good question. Glad to be able to bring this up as well. Lots of gaps is the answer. There's a lot to do. All minorities. I mean, we talk about women as minorities, for Christ's sake, as founders, and they're 50% of the population. There's a lot of work to do. Um, like as a gay guy myself, I'm trying to be, as the question said, a sort of mentor leadership figure for LGBT plus founders. We've done some studies in the group I'm in, which we actually released the press, which got in the press like a, a few months ago, which just showed so many LGBT plus founders like hide who they are to their team, hide who they are to investors. When they go on pitch meetings with investors, they'll sort of hide that side of themselves because they think, you know, they'll be judged. And if you're having to hide yourself, who you are, you're going to be a worse leader and a worse manager. So we need to provide figures to people within all different communities that aren't just white, straight men, that you can be successful, whether you're an ethnic minority, whether you're a woman, I can't believe I to say that, and in the LGBT plus community as well. So I'm just sort of trying to be a figurehead to show that like, investors won't look down on you if you're part of that community if your team do look down on you for that you need to fire them immediately and actually building a much more inclusive company with someone who is a minority at the, the figurehead of that company actually build a much nicer environment we're a very inclusive company at trumpet not by any ways of like picking one person or the other because they're a minority it's just happened naturally and then the vibe in the business is so much nicer for it 
So there's a lot more to do. I'm talking about it a lot. I've set up a group called Proud Ventures. So I haven't set it up. I'm part of it, which is a group of LGBT plus investors. So both VC and angel, because it's a big thing in VC as well. So we're trying to get more people into that group. And then our aim for that is to then help LGBT plus founders. So as mentors or help them get investment and just being proudly yourself and being yourself is great. And actually being in a minority group gives you that different type of personality, that different edge. So actually embrace it and it will make you a much better manager and leader. So yeah, lots still to do, but the dial is slowly moving. It's amazing to hear. Thank you, Nick. I'm really glad we were able to talk about that. And um, yeah, I'm really hoping that we'll see positive change in the right direction on that in the years to come. Final question. If there is one piece of advice you could leave our listeners with today, what would it be? I think it would be trust your gut. Some of the best decisions I've made are from my gut. As the founder, I think you should have that sensitivity to what you're building. And don't be arrogant with that. Take on advice, but always come back to your gut when you're making decisions. Uh, it's really let me down. And be ready for what it's going to be. If you want to be a founder, as I said right at the start, it's the biggest advice. I try and put people off before they become a founder. And it's not just yourself. It's also your loved ones your family, your friends, your lifestyle is going to change dramatically. So you need to make sure everyone around you, your support network is ready to support you, for you becoming probably a worse friend and a worse partner. So make sure you have all of those in line before you take the plunge, because that will help you on your journey. Very wise advice and a fantastic place to end the conversation. Nick, thank you. I am looking forward to signing up to Trumpet and really wish you the very best with the year ahead. And uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed the conversation. So thank you for joining us as a 40 Minute Mentor. Thanks a lot, James. I've enjoyed it. That's all from us today, but do make sure you check out the links in the show notes for more on today's 40 Minute Mentor. And if you have any recommendations for future guests, then why don't you drop our head of marketing and 40 Minute Mentor producer Hannah a line on hannah at jbmc.co.uk. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, and I look forward to seeing you again next week for more pocket-sized mentorship. Mm-hmm.